Bell's lollipop. <laughs> Why don't you just go hand out parking tickets and leave me alone? Stick to something you know about. Listen, my daughter was about your age. Then she met a guy like you. Now she's dead. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. Folks, I'm joined by the tallest man in the room where he's recording. Simon. Hello, Simon. Boogeyman! I'll tell you what I thought that kid was saying. Liet and I had to translate. I yeah. thought he was saying, flea bag. <laughs> <laughs> and then we were wound it like five times and we we kept hearing flea bag. <laughs> and then the second time he says it, we were like, oh, he's saying boogeyman. That's not as good as flea bag. Flea bag! No, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> you do a bad lip reading this whole movie. Flea bag! <laughs> and it reminds me now, have you seen the one that they did of, uh, somebody did of uh, Slayer's Angel of Death, where it's uh, Hey Johnny Depp instead? <laughs> no, that's <laughs> awesome. Oh my God. <laughs> so, folks, we have a very, very requested request from our, our buddy Mark, a mm. contributor contributor to the Doom Show. Yes, thank you, Mark. Yes, thank you so much. Oh, what were you going to say? Oh, uh, should I? Do it. Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, hi, Mark. Uh, Mark had a request, and he would like us to talk about Boogeyman from 2005, <laughs> the hit film directed by Stephen K. Starring Barry Watson, Emily Deschanel, Sky McCall, Bart Tuziak, Tori Mussett, Andrew Glover, Lucy Lawless. What? Okay, mm. he didn't want us to talk about the 2005 Boogeyman. I thought you said Barry White for a minute as well. well, well the the 2005 up. Barry White? Mm. How's he doing? No. <laughs> um, somehow this movie that we're actually talking about is only 0.4 votes higher. Or 0.4. <laughs> it's not very well reviewed. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. I digest. That was a dumb mm -hmm. joke. The Boogeyman from 1980, directed by Uli Lamel. Uli Lamel, one of the weirdest motherfuckers. <laughs> this guy's yeah. career is all over the place. I used to mix him up with Uwe Boll a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it was just the ooh sound and the fact that they're, you know, freaking... Uh, Germans or whatever. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good point. Oh, I, I keep forgetting about him, and I forget. You just reminded me of a movie of his that I think exists. I want to say I didn't hallucinate. It was mm. the one of the postal. Uh, I think that was based on the P PC game, possibly. Yes, he was. He was the postal guy. <laughs> yes, yes, that's funny. Mm. No, I, well, you know what? We got to do House of the Dead. Yes, totally. You and I have got to do House of the Dead someday. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I tried to get rid of that movie, and I love it too much. <laughs> it's so weird. It is mm. like, it's too weird to be bad, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but Uli Lamel, I'm not super familiar. I was shocked that he had so many movies. 66 movies, documentaries, and whatevers. I need to investigate some of his later films. Uh, but he, I've seen Devonsville Terror. Which I highly recommend. I still need um, to see it's, that. It's, 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 oh God, the kittens are wrestling. Ooh, we got hot kitten action. <laughs> oh, that sounds terrible. Um, I've seen uh, The Tenderness of the Wolves, which is very interesting serial killer film mm. uh, based on a real case. And I've seen <laughs> Boogeyman 2 and Return of the Boogeyman, which he has nothing to do with uh, except for the flashbacks. Mm. Mm. But yeah, he's prolific. He's prolific. Yeah, like you say, especially in, um, well, yeah, overall, I think. But uh, I'd heard about this, and I'm just seeing now all these like serial killer films he'd done in the last, mainly in the 2000s. I think he did like a whole run of them. It's crazy. Yeah, BTK, uh, Green River Killer, Zodiac, Black Dahlia, frickin' Son of Sam, Night Stalker, and DC Sniper. What the? Wow. Mm. That's bizarre. And yeah, he acted a lot. Did you um be back to chance to see any interviews with him or read any? It's uh... um no, I did not. 
Yeah, there's a uh, interesting one on this 88 Films Blu-ray, which I'll come to later. There's a bit of trivia, which will, uh, if it's true, will fucking blow your mind. Okay, I'm ready for that. That's hot. Cool. Yeah, this this movie has a, a fair amount of strangeness about it, especially when we get into the uh, sequels, uh, <laughs> whatever they are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> This was a video nasty, but this was not one of the persecuted films. No, I think it it and return or oh, wait, Revenge of the Boogeyman. Either they were on the list, or how did they refer to them? The dropped, uh, however many it was. Yeah, section two, section non two, yeah. non prosecuted. Mm-hmm. Uh, shout out to the uh, doing the nasty podcast. Ah. Love that podcast where they go through all of the video nasties. Section one, section two, and I believe they're on to section three now. Cool, I need to check that out. Can't recommend that show enough. This was eventually released uncut, eventually. Uh, but, you know, it took a long time. It, they they had problems with the sexualized violence in the movie. Um, and I think initially they had problems with the kids being involved. Because there's, there's, you know, we'll go through the whole plot here in a moment. We'll spoil the whole movie. Uh, but there are children that are involved in, like, some violence and some, some harrowing situations. Yeah. Get used to it if you're watching those sequels. Return of the Boogeyman, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. Just stop it. Okay. <laughs> uh, I have found... I, I want to do the comparison of the trailer voices real quick. So we got the difference between the theatrical trailer and then the the difference between the TV spots. We got the two different awesome voice that got... Vo- voice of guys? Voice <laughs> guys. When you were a child... Did they warn you about the boogeyman? When you were a child, did they warn you about the boogeyman? Um, I tried to find a British person saying bogeyman, which I did for the the bogeyman 2 trailer. Now, Simon, you are from the England place, which is right next to – it's between Arkansas and Ohio here in the United (laughs) States. Boogers, like snot, are called bogeys over there, right? Yeah. So the booger man, we're dealing with the snotty guy under your bed. Is that yeah. what your parents were trying to teach you to be afraid of was just blowing your nose? <laughs> I guess so. I hadn't thought about it. Yeah, maybe there's some kind of uh, subconscious kind of uh, trying to sow seeds there to uh, to stop that. But yeah, somebody <laughs> had also said that the reason it wasn't boogeyman over here is because we'd think it's more like, you know, he dances or something. <laughs> <laughs> boogeyman, boogeyman, bow, bow, bow. He'd be the fanny man. I used the yeah. word fanny this morning. That was fun. Yes, you reminded me of uh, Scary Movie Two. You're like, why don't you leave me alone? <laughs> oh, no. what is Scary Movie Two? Does that have a fanny in it? I want to say it's Scary Movie Two. The guy who I forget his name. God, what the fuck else is he in? I think he's in something about Mary as well. Plays oh, Chris the, the weird, yeah, the weird butler guy. He's like, oh, my fanny, my fanny's coming through. I think I think that's him anyway. Hey, even if you're wrong, it's right. Yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> oh, hi, Mark. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> so here Indeed. comes the uh, American trailer here for The Boogeyman. When you were a child, did they warn you about The Boogeyman? The Boogeyman. He hurt bad children and did terrible things to their mommies. But you can't kill the boogeyman. Now, the most terrifying nightmare of childhood returns. The boogeyman. Boogeyman, he's going to get you, and you, and you. You're not going to scare me. (laughs) Had its own power. The Boogeyman. You can't hide from him. (laughs) 
by the time they believe in him, it'll be too late. The Boogeyman. He's going to get you. I was going to read from the American freaking uh, VHS tape, but it's literally the entire plot, <laughs> which is so, I mean, it's two long, maybe four paragraphs, just two long columns on the American VHS. And I said, nah, dog. Not that they would, you know, ever recycle the plot of this film, you know, for like other purposes. <laughs> 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 yes. <sighs> I'm not infuriated at all. <laughs> Mr. Guy who loves clip show movies, who's not me. Okay, uh, so here is the uh, the beautiful Vipco VHS, the the 1992 VHS tape here, which has some interesting things on it here. Uh, it's it's got the Coca Cola logo, and it says cult classic on it in the Coca Cola logo. What? <laughs> what was Vipco doing? Yeah. Uh, but they have this as a frightener. It's a frightener. This videotape's confusing. Anyway, here's the plot. At the age of three, Lacey witnessed a horrifying killer. Oh, fuck. Killing, dash, the murder of her mother's sadistic lover by Lacey's older brother, William. Since he is mute, the bedroom mirror remains the only witness to the incident. Soon afterwards, Lacey and William are sent away to live in Virginia with relatives. Only the house and the mirror remain, keeping their dark secret until, 20 years later, there's a lot of commas in this shit. Hmm. The evil stored within is ready to be awakened. Oh, excuse me. Awakened. That's it. I wish my notes that I'm about to read from were that succinct. I got a little carried away here, Simon. Oh, don't worry. We're going to do this. So the boogeyman opens with some titles to tell us who is responsible for this movie. Oh, uh, some uh, ominous whooshing over the title as well. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. This freaking soundtrack, boy, mm. I'm going to go ahead and say one of the things about this soundtrack, about this soundtrack, about this movie is its soundtrack. Yeah. It is very memorable. Um, I don't know if you have seen the dude on YouTube, uh, Lampy Man. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is he did? He did a video nasty review show. He did, yeah, yeah. And he always used the music from this movie as his ah, intro for many years. Cool. Um, if you guys find, uh, let me look up because I really recommend you guys check out his reviews. Mm, Lampy Man, yeah. Lampy Man one hundred and one on YouTube. Mm, mm. He does a, a, a series of Franco's uh, called Francophile. He does in Extremis, where he talks about really extreme movies. Cynical Celluloid is just great stuff. So find mm, any of these things. Mm. He's he's really awesome. Uh, but yes, the Boogeyman music, dude, uh, by someone named Tim Krog or Krog. Krug. Uh, he did the music for this, and then, of course, it got reused in Boogeyman 2, and that's it? It's a damn shame, yeah, it's really good, and I was going to say I want a I want a Krog synthesizer now. <laughs> that would be so awesome if it was mm. just Uli Lamel misspelling Korg. <laughs> I think it's a good joke, I like it. I love Korg. I have many little Korgs. I'm a Korgy enthusiast. Oh, <laughs> We're gonna, of course, we're gonna do the sequels today. We're gonna talk briefly about uh, the sequels, very briefly about mm. Return of the Boogeyman, as briefly as humanly possible. Like we'll mention that it exists. The yeah. Boogeyman Two. Hmm. Yes. Oh boy. Mm. Oh boy, indeed. Uh, but yeah, this this music is fucking awesome. I need to buy this score on vinyl, man. Yeah. Need... Yeah. Did you see that? I think I sent you a. Some kind of soul, they'd put a uh, video of theirs playing on YouTube. And they had a little, I've never seen one of these before. They had before it included with it a CD vinyl that they said, don't put this in your CD player, it is actually vinyl. It seemed to be, as far as I can tell, just a recording of the trailer put on yeah. this little thing. I've I've seen mini records that like the, the um, something like that, but no, I've actually never seen that. It was really weird. Mm. I wasn't mm. sure what I was looking at. <laughs> <laughs> but, and that vinyl is black in the center and green around the edges. Oh, it's beautiful. Mm. It's like, it's, I love crazy colored vinyl. I think it's a really dynamic piece of music. Yeah. It, it has that really recognizable piece, but then it hits you with so many other things. And it's just, oh, man. So, yeah. Yeah, lots of uh, nice little atmospheric touches and stuff. Um, and one of the things about this movie is when it starts, you see this suburban neighborhood. Uh, you have this haunting synthesizer. You got the POV, and you quickly realize 
I accidentally put on my Halloween 1978 VHS. Whoops. <laughs> I'm watching the wrong movie. Oh, my God. Oh, uh, yeah. It's weird because, like, the opening, obviously, they're reffing off Halloween, but it kind of, um, you know, the, the opening shot, you know, how it pans down from those trees and everything. It's very Halloween, too, as well, like, the, the, the opening oh, yeah. shot of that. Yeah, this is a, this is a, a slasher movie combined with like Amityville Horror mm, mm. Um, and, and some other psychic movie. I'm not sure what. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a, this is not a run of, run of the mill slasher at all, but it, especially part two, it turns into a slasher parody. Yeah. And parts of this are definitely a parody. Oh my God. Mm. So uh, we, we see this woman in her house. This is Kinky Mommy and uh, Kinky Mommy, man, she likes to party. Boy, oh boy, does she like to party. This actress is uh, Gillian Gordon. Um, she was in something else called The Sister-in-Law from 1974. Didn't do anything else. Uh, she's a very interesting looking actress. She likes to, to put her stocking, her pantyhose, on her boyfriend's head. And that, that turns her on. And then later it will turn her off, which is funny. <laughs> and I can't help but think of freaking Christmas Evil during this part. Mm, totally. Like this, oh my God, it's just so weird. This movie's great at reminding me of other films. Um, and here we go. I'm going to go ahead and say it. When the kids are in the window, her, her children are watching this display of perversity, <laughs> which obviously is not that perverse. I know, Simon, you're into this, not judging. <laughs> um, I'm like, wow, Twin Peaks much? Yeah, it's weird you say that because in the scene where um, they go into the you know bedroom before you know um, Willie comes in with the uh, with the knife and everything, <laughs> like that window, there's something about the look of that bedroom. I was expecting Bob to come through it. It just looks like the lighting and everything. It's like identical to Fight Walk with me. Totally. No, I, you said Willie. So every time we say <laughs> Willie, I'm going to giggle. It's fine. We'll get over this. Um, so the kids are peeping, watching this 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 fun stuff, and this adult. This pair of adults, they do what any normal people do when their their kids accidentally walk in on them doing their stuff. They immediately tie the little boy up and gag him as well. Um, and I said, that that seems a little cruel. Mm. Just a little bit. My parents would, uh, I don't know, I, I don't even have a joke. <laughs> <laughs> There's no joke there. I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> oh, I should have thought about that before. So... <laughs> A uh, little sis, uh, little Lacey, gets, goes to the rescue. She gets a butcher knife, and you're like, okay, she's finally going to kill her brother. She's been waiting for this moment. But no, uh, she uses the knife to cut Willie loose. <laughs> and then <laughs> uh, Willie strikes. Willie mm. takes the knife, and we get our, our real, real Halloween ripoff here of him walking through the house with the butcher knife. Oh, that POV I wish shaman. He, uh, it's beautiful. Put on a little uh, Halloween mask. That would have been great. Mm. This is just such a fine way to start this movie. I can I can just imagine people in the theaters going to see this shit. Like, oh man, it has uh, like right from the off as well. Like you know the nice like colored like gel lighting and stuff, all the blue and like yellow and stuff. Yes. It has the uh, you know the atmosphere and um, I suppose you should talk about this now. You know the vibe. You know what kind of a species of it because we're having. I last night, as I think you will have seen, I doubled this with the City of the Living Dead. Because, you know, it, it gives me that feeling of, you know, like Vulture films of that era of, you know, um, you know, European director coming in and making kind of, you know, a film in America and the, the kind of weird feeling that, that that gives it, you know. Even when you have an American cast, sometimes those European directors come over and it just is they're trying to replicate an American style mm. and they fail. <laughs> And it's not a bad fail. Oh, no, it's just not. No. It's not a. It's not a successful. God, you sure fooled us because of those tone. That tone you're talking about. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's it. Well. And also both of them, I guess. With I don't know how much was City of the Living Dead. I mean, although I, I suspect he was kind of doing a bit, you know, because especially when we got to the Beyond, Fulci was kind of coming out and saying, you know, who was he invoking? Like, was it Antonin? Uh, what the hell's his last name? Is it Arto, the Theater of Cruelty guy? And you know, clearly, oh, yeah. you know, putting his his cards on the table, saying, I'm trying, I'm kind of trying to make an art film here. And uh, Uli. Lomel as well, yeah, definitely coming with, and I, I'm not saying this with any, um, in a bad way, with similar pretensions, I guess, and I, I use that word in the most neutral sense I can, I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all, you know. <laughs> no, I get, I get your meaning, and it's, mm. we'll see that that very situation parodied in the next film, so, hilariously so. <laughs> so, uh, Willie stabs the lover to death, and uh, we flash forward to the church scene with some some hot 
freaking church singing. Oh, Reverend has a lovely singing voice, doesn't he? It's, uh, wow, it's piercing and, and lovely. <laughs> we see Lacey all grown up. This is uh, Susanna Love, mm. uh, who uh, was married to Uli Lamel for a while. And uh, boy, howdy, man. I, I love this lady. I'm a, I'm a Susanna Love lover. Yeah, she's great. I mean, not that kind, but you know, <laughs> I love her. And her brother, actor uh, Nicholas Love, plays Willie. Not with his Willie. Stop mm-hmm. it. If he did play with his Willie, he might have been a little less tense. But holy crap, we've got a Twin Peaks connection. Oh, yeah. What the front door. <laughs> so good old uh, Nicholas Love was in uh, Wild at Heart, which oh, I shit. don't think I recognized him. Oh, no, I do now. He's, um, do you remember Man towards the end? God, how would I never notice this? Yeah, uh, I want to, yeah, I'm pretty sure he, towards the end, after um, Nicolas Cage, you know, he's been released from prison the uh, second time, and he's, you know, he's met up with Laura Dern and his son, but he's, you know, they kind of think, oh, no, it's not working, and he walks off. And yeah. uh, sees, goes across, there's been like a car accident, and uh, the guy in the wheelchair, I'm guessing this is Nicholas Love, it's like, oh, my God. Yeah, this, oh, shit, man, the same thing happened to me last year. And, you know, it's just, again, you know, typical. That is so crazy. Classic, uh, you know, disturbing but funny kind of lynch moment. That is so amazing. And, of yeah. course, he was in three episodes of Twin Peaks Season 2, mm-hmm. which, uh, of course, huge, huge disappointment that he didn't show up in uh, The Return. Yeah, okay, him no, uh, no, or I'm his. Uh... I didn't know who he was. <laughs> I'm looking up this character. So he oh, played Malcolm um, Sloan. Yeah, he was the guy who was uh, Evelyn Marsh's brother, not brother. You, the guy who was, I think he was Mr. Marsh's driver fuck. or something. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, man. Dude, <laughs> my mind is blown. <laughs> no wonder you're going crazy when you're messaging about this freaking Twin Peaks connection. God bless America. Wow. So the two of them are sitting in church. I'm trying to recover. The two of them are sitting in church, uh, singing along. And then uh, Lacey goes to confess to the the priest. And uh, she says something I really love. And she says, I feel like something bad is going to happen. Mm. Yep. You are right. (laughs) Uh, So Willie is uh, mute, as as the uh, VHS box states. He and his sister Lacey live with their aunt and uncle who adopted them after mommy had to give them up. Lacey as a kid. Oh, what a sweet little kid. <sighs> Named Kevin. You know. Good old Kevin. Raymond Raymond Boyden, household name. <laughs> Went on to be in The Boogeyman. And then be interviewed about and, uh, The Boogeyman. Boogeyman 2 and, uh, oh, we'll get to this later, Uli Lomel's Boogeyman 2 director's cut. Oh, my brackets God. Brackets video. Yep. Oh, boy, brackets video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> I love this kid. They let him play by a well, and every time he's sitting on the edge of that well, I get the heebie-jeebies, because mm. I just imagine that kid falling. And that, that well must have been sealed off or something, because that is that is horrible. Uh, Sadako climbs out and grabs him. She, she's the one from the Asian horror movies who goes, ah, <laughs> just kidding. That's Kayako. Anyway. <laughs> ah. Uh, at dinner, we have these hilariously idyllic farmhouse dinner scenes, something out of the Waltons or some shit. And uh, they get a letter from uh, their dying mother, and she's just a bitch in the letter. And then you notice something important about the architecture of the house that Lacey, Willie, and the kid and their husband live in. Yes, totally. It's the fucking Amityville house. <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, we'll be mentioning uh, Jake, Lacey's husband, played by Ron James. And Ron James was in one other Uli Lamel movie called A Taste of Sin, a.k.a. Olivia, which also, of course, stars Susanna Love. Yeah, I want, yeah, I want, yeah, I want, yeah, I want to see some of his, some more of his 80s movies. Mm. There's something about him. I don't know. Yeah. I want to see brainwaves, which uh, <laughs> we'll be discussing brainwaves very briefly because uh, there's scenes of it in one of his other movies we'll be talking about briefly. Brainwaves. They have violated the laws of nature. Yeah, I didn't realize he, uh, like I say, this, uh, if I'd realized this uh, interview with Susanna Love was this long, I would have read it early this week, but I just had a chance to skim some of it. And yeah, I'll pull some bits about the Boogeyman later, but um, I want to say, did he do a movie or they did a movie with Klaus Kinski later as well? Because it seems like, from what I can tell here, that um, she ran off with Klaus for a while. Hmm. 
that would be um, not a good decision. Yeah, it, uh, this is towards the end of the interview. It said, but you did not stay with Klaus for long, right? Uh, yeah, it was good while it lasted, but I finally did leave him. I called him a stinky old man. He was t- a total tyrant, tyrant and always putting people down all the time. Oh, boy. It's because he was mentally disturbed. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 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 That Klaus got some hot ladies, man. He did not. <laughs> he had a way about him. Mm. So at the dinner table, you have the terrifying chicken carving scene. Oh, boy. Uh, the, the knife uh, just slicing up that delicious chicken uh, is, is making Lacey crazy. And she's just haunted. I love her performance in this. She's like totally freaked out. Uh, after dinner. <laughs> oh, yeah. This movie likes to have flashbacks to mm. the inciting incident of the, the children and their, their trauma. Uh, but that we didn't realize this would be a thing with all the movies. <laughs> flashback, flashback, flashback. Uh, Willie steals the knife off the table, takes it upstairs, and he has a whole knife collection. And Lieta was like, how did they not know he is stealing the knives and the freaking meat cleavers and everything. What is going on here? But he burns the letter from mom, who's who's saying, you know, come back. I want to see you one more time before I die. He's like, fuck you, bitch. <laughs> we have this great moment where Lacey's in the bathroom with her kid. Uh, she's getting Kevin to brush his teeth, which, folks, I don't know if I've talked about this on the Doom Show before. We've been recording for 17 years now, so <laughs> I probably have. Watching people brush their teeth in movies makes me get chills really bad. <laughs> I've never brushed my teeth. I don't want to get into it. No, I'm just, I'm just saying, <laughs> for some reason, it always makes me go Ooh, like that. I don't know why. <laughs> I well, I wonder how you'll feel about a certain scene in Boogie Man 2 then. <laughs> oh, my God. Which was so ridiculous, it didn't bother me. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, this great moment of foreshadowing happens when after her, her, her son, Kevin, leaves the room, she's staring in the mirror and she wipes off half of the mirror. And half of her face is obscured, and that half, I believe, is where the the mirror will be happening. Oh, later shit. I year. never noticed that, I don't think. I'm not conscious. I think. Mm. I think. It was very interesting. Mm. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we see in... <laughs> uh, we see this dream sequence. Spoiler alert, this is a dream sequence. Willie goes into this room. There's a disgusting rotten deer head on the wall. Someone did not do good taxidermy on this deer head. It looks disgusting. And it made me think of um, the song by the Locust called Moth Eaten Deer Head. Oh, right, yeah. Which uh, is a fine, fine song by them. I love them. <laughs> this turns out to be Lacey's Nightmare. She's tied up, and we have gratuitous knife sharpening, and she's in her underwear, mm. and it's she has this whole nightmare. She wakes up screaming, and her husband, Jake, wants to talk about the dream, wants to talk about her past. And she tells him straight up, I don't want to remember. Now, folks, Jake is trying to help. Always remember, Jake is trying to help. He's wrong. He should stop trying to help. But he's trying to help. He's going to he's gonna bring about the death of lots of people. <clears throat> One of my few notes, I think, about particularly about Jake was uh, patronizing much. Yeah, I forgot about that. (laughs) (laughs) He is. He totally is. Let's enter into a scene with John Carradine, folks. Mm. When John Carradine is your psychotherapist or whatever, (laughs) you're fucked. Yeah, it uh, made me think of, um, you know, similarly with Ivan Razumov in shock. (laughs) You are in trouble. But, you know, it's one of those things where the trivia is like, all of David Carradine's scenes were shot in one day. I'm like, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> he doesn't exist outside of that room. Yeah, apparently Uli Lomel picked him up at like five in the morning. They went and shot it all. And then he fell, you know, he was taking him home at night, fell asleep on the freeway. He's like, yeah, better take a nap. He's like, no shit. <laughs> Don't kill our national treasure. That's it. I mean, even if he was in his 80s, it's like, you know, don't precipitate his, uh, you know, shuffling off this mortal coil, please. Uh, he, oh, he hypnotizes her. I love hypnotism scenes in horror movies. That's mm. like a, my new favorite thing. And uh, immediately we get a possession moment. Oh, so amazing. We've got Amityville Horror, The Exorcist, freaking Halloween, all mashed into one for no fucking reason. Uh, when uh, when <laughs> when Susanna Love is under, she, they they do her voice all demonic, and this immediately scares jake so bad he's like man we gotta we gotta go back to their family home 
which makes me think this is the time to repress. Mm -hmm. Just go home and live with the nightmares. Find that drug that uh, Nancy was taking in Nightmare on Elm Street 3 that made her not dream anymore. Come on. (laughs) Just bury that shit, dog. Jake, I'd like to ask you not to discuss Lacey's condition with the rest of the family. Tell me, Doctor, why was she talking like that? We were out to find out. Where is the mother now? Well, they haven't seen each other since that night. But yesterday we got this letter from her, and uh, I think this is what brought back all these memories. Hmm. They live just across the river in Virginia. Is the house still there? I, I don't know. I guess so. Why? I want you to go back with her and take a look at it. You've got to convince her. She has to see the house and remember it the way it is now, not the way it was 20 years ago. Uh, so while they're going to the house, when they're going to the, the old homestead where all the trauma happened, Lacey's pal shows up. Lacey's friend comes to pick up some eggs. I cannot remember her freaking name to save my life. But uh, this lady shows up and immediately tries to seduce Willie. She tries to break that Willie out of his coveralls. <laughs> just unleash the Willie. I got a million of them, folks. No, I don't. I just have those two. <sighs> yep. So she says to Willie that this amazing line. She says, whenever we're in church, I want you. <laughs> And uh, Willie doesn't do this. He doesn't do good with women, especially not when there's a mirror around. So while she's flirting with him, he sees himself in a mirror, gets possessed by the spirit of mom's lover and starts choking her, lifts her off her feet, which, uh, hey, we need a safe word here, people. (laughs) She gets away. Willie doesn't kill her. Thank God. She recoils and is like, you're crazy. No shit. Willie starts painting the mirrors black. Rolling Stones reference. And he's got to paint all the mirrors. I love... It's such a creepy thing. Just every mirror. that The ant is walking around the house and every fucking mirror is painted. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I bet um, him and Kiefer Sutherland's character in mirrors, they'd get on pretty well, wouldn't they? Have, oh, have a fun yeah. time, you know, painting all afternoon. Oh my god, I forgot about that movie. <laughs> uh, they get to the house, the, the, the old house, and it's a family is living there. Uh, but they are trying to sell it. Uh, the parents are away, so the teenagers and the little kid... Uh, the flea bag little kid. Fleabag! They are uh, like, oh, you want to look at the house? Come on in. Of course, they lie and pretend they're home. They're prospective home buyers are touring the whole place. Timmy scares Lacey by screaming flea bag <laughs> from the shower. Fleabag! Uh, he does not scream flea bag. He screams boogeyman. But dude, it's great. Uh, he flirts with Lacey. He says, hey, gorgeous. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> This little shithead kid is so awesome. <laughs> oh, he's up there in the, the pantheon of just terrible children in horror films. Oh, my lord. Uh, he's, he's played by David Schwimmer, a young David Schwimmer <laughs> from Friends. No, he's played by David Swim, oh and this, of God. course, is his only acting credit. Man, fucking David Schwimmer. <laughs> damn it. Can't stand that fucking guy. Anyway, <laughs> he's probably doing some push-ups and screaming into a mirror in himself. Did you say I haven't watched it, but somebody had done a recall of scenes from Friends, but they'd taken the laugh track off with him on, just to make him look like a complete psychopath. <laughs> yeah, I have indeed. I have indeed. <laughs> uh, Lacey follows Timmy around, and she ends up in the bedroom, and uh, she's staring into that mirror, the mirror that started this whole thing when freaking Willie was stabbing the, the, the lover you could see him in the reflection. Da, da, da. And when she looks in the mirror, she sees the lover's ghost on the bed. But when she looks at the bed, he's not there. Genuinely creepy. Oh, man, it's so good. Oh, yeah, and you get the most uh, amazing stinger as well, which you'll hear again later, you know, when she, the reveal oh, of her being possessed comes up. Fucking awesome. Uh, she beats the shit out of the mirror. Mirror does not take it very well. Now, here's when the movie gets completely fucking wacko where jake the husband does something so fucking stupid now folks this is hello this is the doom show i know we we talk about shit thanks to jeffrey (laughs) thanks to the movies we choose but really jeffrey where nothing makes any sense but the therapy, the the idea that the Jake wants her to confront her fears by bringing home a broken mirror 
Mm. Bagging up this broken mirror, he apologizes. He offers to pay for the mirror. The teenagers are like, nah, dog, it's all good. And they, they freaking leave with the mirror, the broken mirror, and a bag of parts, bag of pieces. And fucking, she's trying to stop him. Yeah, it doesn't bode well either when she takes him to a therapist that has a giant mirror wall behind him, I think. <laughs> oh my god, it's mirrors, man. Mirrors. Mm. And uh, he wants to take it back to the farm, and my favorite laugh-out-loud moment in this movie, for me, is when the movie cuts jarringly to Jake putting the mirror back together <laughs> in the kitchen. Yeah. He has fucking reassembled this mirror piece by piece and i laugh so hard it does not make a lick of fucking sense oh, that's it, because just to share my time he must have taken how insane he would look you know yeah, when she yeah. saw him do that so she's got horrible memories and he's ocd motherfucker <laughs> That's so good uh so uh back at the house we go back to the teenagers um this is I, i'm so bad at these these teenagers names um Maybe Jane and Susan, I think. Well, there's three people. There's four people here who were just literally credited as teenager, so that doesn't really. Uh... Oh yeah, well those those are probably the ones making out. Oh, later on, yeah. Sorry, I'm getting ahead yeah. of myself. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very confusing. It's very confusing. It'll be Jane, Jane and Susan. Then we think, yeah. They're hanging. Uh, the one girl, she's cutting up the biggest peppers I've ever seen. She's making mm. some kind of a salad and. These green peppers, they look like as big as heads of lettuce. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? Must be in farm country or something. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. Uh, the one girl wants to cut her hair, but her scissors are missing. She goes looking for her scissors. Meanwhile, Timmy is eating his weight in ice cream. <laughs> I had no idea what he was eating. He's taken one of those old-timey boxes of ice cream and has disassembled it to make it into a giant bowl, and I think he's intending to finish it. Yeah, I think it said coffee on the outside of it, so, you know, actually got Ooh, Timmy. Mm. Flea bag! <laughs> <laughs> so, he gets, a, he gets a naughty idea because the one sister's in the bathroom doing her thang, oh cutting her hair, and she's yeah. doing it. I always remember this actress as being completely topless, mm -hmm. but it's my brain... Making their flesh-colored top disappear. Yes, yes, I hate So, it. because I'm a pervert. <laughs> it's okay, you know, so is Timmy. You know, you're eating good company oh, there. Now, God. what is going yes. on with these two? Because she oh, boy. presumes he's already about, although he's outside looking up at the window. Yes. And regarding Jeff, she's like, oh, he's so handsome. You know, as if she's, like, trying to make a brother jealous. It's like, what? She is literally trying to make her brother jealous. That's so good. So, of course... She's in the bathroom talking to this POV. This we know it's not Timmy, but of course, you know. And she confesses her 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 incestuousness for her brother. And then he's climbing up the side of the house to peek in the window. But she starts to cut her hair and goes crazy. The scissors are controlling themselves. <sighs> Get used to sharp objects controlling themselves. That's a theme. It will never go away. Uh, but instead, uh, she she cuts her top and then she freaking stabs herself in the throat. As she's dying, Timmy climbs in the window and screams flea bag. <laughs> uh, but this time he mispronounces it where it sounds like Boogeyman. Boogeyman! The window falls and crushes his neck and you hear a crunching sound. <laughs> which isn't the lamest death in this movie. Oh boy. <laughs> it's just about to happen. The other sister comes up. She sees this crazy scene. Uh, the, the shard of the mirror that was left behind is this... Is, is it the incitement? I'm going to use the word incite a lot in this episode for no reason. Misuse the word. And she picks up this mirror and she's shaking like a leaf with this mirror. And she puts it in the sink, bleeding all over the place. The, the, the piece of mirror hits the sink, catches on fire. And then the lamest thing ever, which I rewound two times because I had to see it. <laughs> Imagine rewinding this movie to see something again <laughs> when you intend to watch the sequels. <laughs> big, big mistake. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the freaking medicine cabinet smacks her in the face, presumably killing her. What the fuck? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like the scissors, you're like, fair enough. The window, still kind of, you know, especially when you hear the crunching. But yeah, okay, it's like, okay, that happened. Uli Lamel is a funny dude. He oh, likes to make man. comedies. <laughs> I think so. Uh, we get Willie and his bag of uh, mirror <laughs> shards. 
I don't know. <laughs> his Willie in his sack. Okay, there we go. He's got his mirror shards. Um, whenever the, the, the mirror shards are around, things happen. His radio goes all crazy. Uh, pitchfork flies at him, and just before he gets killed, Lacey jumps and grabs him. And then uh, we get another scene of Jake's condescension. Here we go. <laughs> He's uh, trying to get Lacey to give up these crazy fantasies and to stop all this bullshit. It's time to go to the lake, do some fishing. So as as Kevin, little Kevin, I think I've been calling him Willie by accident. So in case you're confused, good. <laughs> Kevin wants to go fishing. So he and mom go off to the lake. This movie, man, it's so pretty. This freaking cinematographer. Uh, there's two cinematographers yes. credited. Uh, one dude, I think, was one of the producers. Uh, Jokin Brightston, Brightonston, I'm totally butchering that name. He's a producer. Apparently he grabbed the camera and shot some shit. Not sure. But the main dude who shot this is David Sperling. This dude shot some cool freaking stuff. Now he worked with Uli Lamel on Olivia, AKA A Taste of Sin, but he shot, uh, Toxic Zombies, another video nasty. Toxic Zombies is a movie from my youth that, uh, freaked me out as a kid and it's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's enjoyable it's it's got a charm to it but it's uh it's kind of a, sno- a sleeper kind of a snoozy that was one i saw on a uh, commander usa's groovy movies as a kid uh he also uh shot freaking street trash oh my god which i saw for the first time um my god love me some freaking street trash and then his career just took off yeah he's he's uh he's still working to this day shooting all kinds of things and uh yeah Cool. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice career. <laughs> I think, wait a minute, he was, I don't think he was the only cinematographer on Street Trash. Because I don't think he was the guy with the freaking, uh... Because uh, Jim, Jim Muro was it who directed it. He, uh, you know, he owned a Steadicam, which was obviously a good investment for him. So he went on to work on all these, like, Megabooks films, like Terminator 2 and stuff. There you go. I almost remember the Joe Bob trivia. Ugh. Almost. <laughs> Oh boy. But yeah, Street Trash. Wow. What a film. Mm, oh. What a f- fucking insane film. Yeah. While uh, good old Kevin and, and Lacey are innocently fishing, because, you know, moms always take their sons fishing. That is the stereotype. <laughs> Not really, but it should be. Fuck, yeah. I don't want to go fishing. <laughs> God, my dad tried to get me to fish, and now I hate fishing. Just like my dad tried to get me into football. Mm hmm. Didn't yeah. work. Not keen on either. <sighs> you can take a horse to water, but you can't take a bag of glass shards away from a willy <laughs> that's the saying we get a double death well we get an almost blow job from these teenagers so these are like college age people not necessarily teenagers they're hanging out by the lake goofing on each other being assholes and one dude is wearing a triumph t-shirt i'm assuming it's the band triumph <laughs> and, and not the cars but uh oh we got a kitten i don't know if you can hear that um Yes. Kitten cameo. Nice. Spasmo. That's Spasmo, by the way. I don't know. I don't know if the microphone picked it up too well, but that's our Spasmo. She's trying to star on the show. Oh, my, my dog noped out of the room ages ago. He's like, For bye. Reason. <laughs> See you. I'm not going to go into this this dynamic of these two couples other than no. the, the they decide not to have sex in the creepy ass abandoned house and they want to go back to uh, his place or something or her place and the mirrors, the, the, uh, the mirror which glued itself to Kevin's shoe is is reflecting all over the place. Evil mirrors. The the boyfriend goes to the car and he gets killed by a freaking meat skewer for their barbecue. And he's stuck there. And the girlfriend goes to see what's wrong with him because he's taking a really <laughs> long time. When she looks in the car, the best moment, he just looks at her going. <laughs> she's freaked out. The mirror piece makes the car door smack her in the butt. <laughs> And she goes flying into him. We get great double death. Indeed. And the other couple at the lake just think that they've... <laughs> this is the longest kiss I've ever seen. What a bunch of perverts. I love that song as well that it's playing while they're driving off. What is it? Baby Go Bye Bye. It's like yeah. very, uh, <laughs> very apt. And I didn't realize, and this actually ties into... We'll get into Boogeyman too. That was done by... It was just, they did two songs for this. Uh, four out of five Doctors. 
Yes. What a fucking awesome name for a band. They were the uh, the band, I believe, in uh, House and Sorority Row, and we'll come to them again. Like oh, say, my and, uh, God. That's why that, I, was, I was thinking watching Boogeyman 2. I suppose we're going to talk about it now. It's like, why do these songs sound familiar? It's because, of course, they were in that fucking movie. Dude, thank you. That's great trivia. I did not, I did not know that connection. Fuck. <laughs> oh. oh, here comes a kitten. What are you doing, dude? Spasma? <laughs> What's up, bitch? <laughs> here she comes. She's getting on the table. Get on the desk here. I am so distracted, folks. Oh, if you only so knew good. how cute how cute this kitten is. Maybe I'll put her in the <laughs> art for the episode since Do she's it. a guest star. Uh, one thing about uh, the girl who doesn't get killed, the one who drives away their boyfriend, she looks so much like a girl I had a crush on. It's disturbing. Oh, yeah. I chased that girl for five years. and She <laughs> was a dickhead. She was like... Oh, are you dating somebody right now? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, oh, I suddenly have feelings for you. I'm like, okay. Oh, Break up with my girlfriend. Oh, you know what? This is weird. <sighs> You're like my brother. And I'm like, I can work with that. Oh, no. Do you know about Willie? <laughs> Do you know about Timmy? Fleabag. <laughs> Fleabag! So we've got lots of heavy breathing. We get lots of freaking awesome stalking. This is, oh, man, just slashy, slashy goodness. Mm. And then their friends, like you said, leave them there, drive off. Back at the house, it's it's almost something's going on. Maybe dinner time's coming. Jake finds a mirror shard on the ground in the kitchen and tries to put it back and everything goes haywire. And another shaky, shaky blood as you're cutting yourself on the glass. Lacey's shirt starts ripping open and she's screaming. Now, Jake believes her. Now, uh, the dad, who's actually the uncle, the older guy, he believes her too. He's like, I'm calling the fucking priest. <laughs> Calls in Father Riley, um, as played by someone named Llewellyn Thomas. Not a prolific, act- prolific actor at all. Uh, this was his only movie. But he's the dude in all the artwork mm. with the blood dripping down his face. I have a Boogeyman t-shirt, which I bought when I was skinny. Mm. And no longer fits. Fuck everything. Uh, man Uh, uh, uh. Man. it is an awesome shirt i got it from evil speak magazine and it was cheap and it was great until i got fat again (laughs) got it it's uh i feel like i've seen them as something else but i think it's just because i've seen that artwork that much you know yep over and over and over you know what you saw him and you saw him in boogeyman too and return (laughs) of the boogeyman exactly priest comes in to save the day uh, Lacey is fucking losing her mind now. Mm. She's freaking out, and it's ah, I can't, I can't help but love Susanna Love, mm. dude. She's mm. so good in this. I just I can't stress that enough. Absolutely. She has a weird way of delivering dialogue that I think people interpret as bad, but I don't know, man. I like her. No, I um, no, I think it's pretty straight up. Uh, she's she's literally praying to God to get her through this. It's oh man, I feel for her. It's kind of funny that because yeah, her prayers are answered, but I suppose that's because Dad's calling the priest in the previous scene. But it kind of <laughs> works out nicely. And then hold on, the cat's on. Come on, move it. Oh my God, <laughs> she's almost walking on my keyboard. I'm like, I don't want to know what's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> Jake goes back to David Carradine. No, no, no. (laughs) So dumb. This part is so fucking dumb, dude. I just, just, it's now nighttime. So it's the end of the shooting day. So everyone's fucking punch drunk. Oh, it's so funny. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Yeah, he's about to like read him a previous case, which he thinks he might have some bearing. And then he's like, ah, no, not interested. I'm going. (laughs) Somebody says... Do you yourself believe in evil as a tangible force? Oh yeah, the um, I forgot about this. The, uh, the and the priest just completely dodges this question. So it's like, oh, so this um, mirror has its own force. So so I, I can't remember the fuck he says. But anyway, the mirror it doesn't like the priest touching it because it, everything suddenly goes red. I think right after that. Oh yeah, dude, it's so. Oh my god. Mm. So everything goes red. We get the mirror and the eye. So so Lacey. The mirror, the piece has flown up and has gotten like on her eye. It's it's just a wonderful thing. Oh, that show is amazing. Oh, if I was a lady, like a sleek, sexy lady, I would totally cosplay as I get that freaking blue dress, which looks mm. like a bathrobe, weirdly <laughs> enough, and just have the freaking mirror glued to my eye. And dude, oh my god, <laughs> so cool. Indeed. Both her aunt and uncle get killed in in the barn. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's... Uh, oh, oh, boy. You know, even though it's off screen, I still love this. And it, it's very like, um, I don't know, like Friday the, Friday the 13th Part 3 or something like that almost. You know, just the barn's always a good slasher location. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Brad and I text each other, uh, we notice that, bam, the word like B-A-M looks like barn if you so or barn <laughs> looks like bam yes. so i always text him like barn <laughs> that's great uh that's that's just how fun brad and i are look out jake comes home and uh lacy is freaking cooking dinner and being completely <laughs> creepy as shit yeah oh my god i love it um when jake finally gets a look at her She's got the mirror on her eye, and uh, he makes his eyes bleed, which is one of my, I think, the, like, the most iconic shot from this mm. fucking movie, is when he, his eyes are bleeding in the kitchen, he's covering his eyes. Oh, man. I just love that fucking sequence. Oh, it's wonderful. Absolutely. And it, it's showdown time. We're getting to the fucking, the brawl, the battle for Lacey's soul, y'all. Lacey, what are you doing? I'm keeping supper, dear. Lisa, you're Ernest and Helen are dead. Oh, that makes it different for Father Valley, you're staying, aren't you? Would you be a down and fix me a drink? <laughs> Priest tries to help. Good luck with that. He's bleeding from his head. Blood's everywhere. That I, that the artwork you've seen a thousand times happens. <laughs> Uh, he takes the mirror off her eye, right? Yeah, he does. Yeah, even though he's like had a load of uh, kitchen utensils and what have you flow into his back, he still manages to kind of get across and uh, extract the mirror piece. God bless so him. Carrie, this is also a Carrie ripoff. <laughs> 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 oh, shit on a brick. This movie's so wonderful. Yeah. And so uh, all is well. We, we save the day. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think of this. Willie is just sitting at the dinner table screaming during all this. Fucking yeah, he has awesome. his uh, sort of calling forward to, is it Joey? How of Nightmare on Elm Street Dream Warriors? Yes. And I find oh, his yes. voice. It's so good. Lacey! <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what their brother and sister relationship was really like if this mm. was just the most hilarious thing ever. Or if, like, they had a real childhood trauma and this was their therapy movie, like, that would be, man, that'd be something else. Oh, yeah. Uh, Susanna Love, if you're listening, let me know, brother. Well, like you say, from what I'd read in this interview with her, she does sound like she had a bit of a wild time, especially when she was in Hollywood, so... uh, Oh, boy. Well, we'll talk about that when we get to the next one. Mm. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. (laughs) So we think it's over. They go to the grave of the the aunt and uncle. Uh, Nobody goes to the priest's grave. That's fucked up. You know, that's, mm, yeah. that's mean. We don't see, I don't think we see Jake again. Uh, no, we don't. But he's not dead. He's alive. He survives. I always think, you know, when they go to the well and he, you know, is like, ah, you know, and have the literally explosive disposing of the mirror. I always forget that, you know, he does actually survive that. He doesn't go up in flames. Thank you for catching that. Oh, no worries. They take the mirror piece, throw it in the well, because apparently water stops the power. I don't fucking mm, know. Mm. And the well explodes. And yeah, well, <laughs> how is he alive? I think they just left him alive just because. Just, yeah. to, just to say. I think when they first, before they filmed that last scene, they probably just decided he was dead and then changed <laughs> at the last minute for no fucking reason. Yeah. Uh, but, um, uh... Kevin is playing with another little boy in the park. In the park, <laughs> the fucking <laughs> cemetery, <laughs> and they're wrestling. It's disturbing. I I fucking hate little boys, man. Mm-hmm. It's I just I was not a normal kid. Like if some kid was wrestling with me in the cemetery, I would probably be completely traumatized because of Salem's Lot. But oh yeah, yeah. More importantly, this kid's holding him down, and I was just I just wanted to start crying watching this. Like, yeah, I was <laughs> not really a tough kid. That's why it's so shocking that I'm such a brawler now. What? <laughs> so we see the mirror on the shoe. Dun dun dun. It's not over. Okay, Spasmo. <laughs> <laughs> Lieta went out, so the cat is freaking out because, of course, she does not love me. She's just waiting until we talk about her uh, about her cameo and uh, Boogeyman too. Oh, that's right. No, I, I meant Lieta doesn't love me. So, uh. Uh, <laughs> no, we're good. So the movie's over. We get that is it over dun da da stinger. Booyah. That's the whole plot of this one. If you missed anything, you'll see it in Boogeyman 2 and Return. Oh yeah. 
the the little like um, mirror shard, you know, how it's kind of glowing red. Does that remind you at all of? I forget what it is. It's like a stone or something in Sweet House, Sweet House of Horrors. Oh shit! Yes, the uh, oh, I, it was a rock. Yeah, that was yeah. possessed by the parents of the kids. Mm-hmm. Fuck everyone, get out of the way of the bulldozer, <laughs> man, folks. If you haven't seen Sweet House of Horrors. Go watch it. Oh, it's yeah. wonderful. Indeed. Man, that's the full, the, the little Fulci movie that couldn't. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we have some sweet trivia, I bet, about this fucking movie. I bet you. Do you want to go? Do you want me to read from this? Uh, let's see, I've got some notes from this interview with, uh, yes. with Lee Uh yes, So, please. yeah, shot in October 79 for about four weeks, I think, for 300k. Uh, he, uh, so he didn't want to go back to New York again because the year before he'd been there, you know, to edit the film, it was cold as shit. So he ended up driving with the print, like, cross-country for days and days to LA, I think, to <laughs> somewhere called the Tropicana Hotel, and he rented a suite, including a room to edit. And uh, there's two stories about this i've heard one says at the pool that he met and i still can't get over this is that this is if it's true and he did hang out with some interesting people so it's entirely possible uh william fucking burrows what the, the, the other story i've heard says that burrows knocked on his door one night because he heard these weird noises presumably him editing the film coming and uh, he invited him and apparently helped him start editing the scene uh, editing the film specifically the fucking kiss of death scene with the and i was going to ask you about that was that a shish kebab that impaled him yeah. so sort of calling forward obviously to uh, happy birthday to me <laughs> i think it was <laughs> nice but um what william burrows that's insane so yeah this was apparently quite a big success he was saying to the extent they couldn't make the prints fast enough uh this later leading he says to paramount we're going to give him three million dollars to make a sequel but it didn't work out because Holy you know he's shit. an auteur and the rest of it and i have a direct quote from him here he says uh <laughs> this is just funny going on uh, i really hate sequels Oh my god. Yeah. So is as you can How dare you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh so his arm was twisted, but he was told he could do anything. Uh so, you know, as revenge he played himself as the director, you know, who doesn't want to make a horror film, you know. Uh <laughs> shooting it mostly too mostly at his house. Uh it's kind of sort of a commentary on this sort of thing, I guess. Uh, and yeah, I may as well read all this com- uh, out now before we get to two and three. Saying later he'd sold the rights to someone else for three, and three he describes as uh, he says that sort of a quirky little thing, which I <laughs> can't disagree there. Uh-huh. Uh, apparently, later licensed the name for the ones in the two thousands, and I have some. These are just by the by, but I just still thought it would be kind of interesting insight into his mind uh, some further quotes from says uh, most of us were uh, or all of us were all children and no one grows up television is for five year olds wow and yeah he tried to do most of the takes in one because that's just kind of how he rolls which yeah. leads him uh, towards the end to uh, and this will tie into two to shit talking Brian De Palma because uh, you know <laughs> Uli Lomel's uber uh, economical and uh, De Palma really isn't. No. Uh, so yeah, he's, he's a um, interesting bloke, I would say, Mazzuli. According to the trivia, there's a poster for Boogeyman in De Palma's blowout. Yes, yeah, that. And I, since uh, De Palma you, was yeah. making, they were making a bad horror movie in that movie. I wonder mm-hmm. if uh, Lamel was like, "Oh fuck you, asshole." <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, that that explains it. God, I'm glad you caught that. I forgot about that because yeah, in Boogeyman 2, they're specifically shit-talking blowout, aren't they? <laughs> uh, let's see this. Uh, something interesting here. At least to me. Huh, I'm not an interesting guy. Whatever. Um, according to Wikipedia, like you said, this movie is about $300,000 to shoot. According to this, the box office for Boogeyman, $25 million. Mm. That is nuts. Yeah. No wonder the the fallout with the sequels. Um, let's see. This was uh, distributed on uh, VHS, as I said before, by Vipco. In the U.S., it was distributed on Wizard Video, the uh, the freaking uh, infamous Wizard Video with their big boxes. <laughs> um, I have an interesting copy of Boogeyman. I have the CED. So, mm-hmm. folks, this is a format that I had never heard of before. Let me look up uh, this real quick, what it stands for. Uh, Capacitance Electronic Disc. There's a pot of 
gold waiting for you at the end of our rainbow. What you've just seen is a small part of what will be available. There's more and more to come. A wide selection of wonderful entertainment on the new CED stereo video discs. Take it away, Kermit. When you open one of these things up, it will make your mind leak out of your ears because <laughs> it's it's as big as a laser disc oh my god it looks like a laser disc case yeah but it's plastic and when you click the little um dealies on the side you pull the thing out and inside mm. is a giant floppy disc like mm. willy ha <laughs> <laughs> so it's crazy because mm. you expect to see a silver disc like a laser disc but this is it's literally this black Freaking floppy disk with little grooves on it. It looks it's like almost, a, a record. It's, it's so a, neat. It's like a giant mini disc or something as well. Yes. Uh, Naf and I were at a uh, flea market years and years and years and years ago, and we found this store at the flea market, at one of the worst flea markets in town. Oh my god, Leah and I went back there a couple years ago. It was terrifying. That's the Gun Highway flea market for you tampons out there. And the dude had. Not only did he have a bunch of CEDs, like Star Wars, Return of the Jedi, and all these films, he had a fucking CED player that he claimed worked. Mm. Wild. And I did not buy it. But then, many, even more years later than that, Nafa went back there, and he found the, a box that we did not go through, and he found the Boogeyman on CED, and he found um, Friday the 13th Part 2. Nice. Which I immediately threw in a freaking box and shipped to uh, to Brad. But of course. Yeah. And I still have the uh, Boogeyman CED hanging up on my wall cool. in the music room. That's why I'm so proud of it. Let's see. How should we do this? Do we want to talk about um, how we feel about this film now and then briefly discuss the sequels? Sure. I don't see why not. Uh, so I volley to you like the guy who punts the volleyball in, <laughs> uh, in golf. Uh, how do you feel about the Boogeyman... 1980. Oh man, I fucking love this film. It, um, yeah, I, I'm trying to when I first saw it. I think I saw it before I picked up uh, 88 films he put out on Blu-ray over here. And just let me check. Apparently, this is region free, and I'm guessing it's still available. So uh, oh, yeah, well, worth, I better worth get picking that. Up. I better get that. Yeah, man. Yeah, you know, it was one that I, I really dug right from the off. But you know, in the last um, year or two, you know, in recent rewatches, it has really become just like a you know a firm, firm favorite. Just something I can stick on pretty much any time. You know, just yeah, love it. Yeah, I, I guess I alluded to this before, but yeah, again, it's it's just really you know me. I I think you know you're kind of like this as well. A, a lot of you know among other things in horror films, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we love these things, you know, but um, mood and atmosphere is always, always a big thing. And this, like I said, just from like the opening shots, just has it in spades, definitely assisted by the uh, the lighting and uh, the score, especially, you know, I say I was vibing out, you know, anytime I watch this. Oh, yeah, that's exactly where I'm at. Um, 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 I find this movie silly enough to goof on. Yeah, yeah. Big time. Yeah, <laughs> but totally. Then it's, but then it's serious enough. Mm-hmm. Where the elements of, of psychology and stuff is as trite as mm -hmm. they can be, there's still a real performance. Oh, now the other cat. Now we got a Gorgon. <laughs> Silent but deadly. <laughs> Don't step on the keyboard. Fuck. <laughs> Hold on. Get on. Get up. Oh my God, she's heavy. You have the the, the performance from Susanna, Susanna Love that just sells it. Mm. She's like She really makes you feel for her character and she really just oh man just obviously the director was you know very taken with her mm -hmm. as was the cameraman because the camera just loves her yeah and aside from a, a little bit of of exploitation shots um, there's no like shower scene with her or anything she really just owns this movie and mm. it's just so freaking beautiful absolutely the sentient mirror pieces and the kinky weird shit you know the the incest the hints of incest and a little bit of bondage stuff thrown in there all these little elements stolen from other films put together in this wonderful package i wish i'd seen this as a kid i mm. really do yeah, uh, because too. this would have just captured my imagination i didn't see this until um, i randomly picked up the old uh, anchor bay boogeyman slash boogeyman 2 dvd and i really Whoa, cat just fell off the shelf. That was amazing. She should have said flea bag before she jumped down. Flea bag! I, I liked Boogeyman the first viewing, didn't love it at all. 
Mm. And I tried watching the second one. And as soon as they started doing the clip show, I bailed and never watched Boogeyman 2. Mm, and then I sold it. And I just, I just traded it in somewhere. Fuck it. And then years later, I realized the error of my ways mm. and mm. managed to score a copy of Boogeyman with the Devonsville Terror, the ancient Anchor Bay mm. uh, non-anamorphic widescreen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll take what I can get. The mm. DVD looks great. I mean, it's... You know, the early DVDs, they don't always look like shit. No, no, this is true. I did not watch the Devonsville Terror because I thought it was terrible. I watched one minute or less of it and just turned it off like an idiot. And 2018, I was, damn it, I'm going to watch all these unseen horror movies. Threw on Devonsville Terror. I might have read a good review of it that inspired me to to finally get to it, but I fucking love that one. So Mm -hmm. that one will likely be happening on this show. Cool, yeah. Like I said, I'm excited to watch that. I'm sure I'm with Rivet in a Mill Creek pack. I might do. Might. You might just have it. Hmm. Remember the original Bogeyman? Well, he's back, more terrifying than ever, in Revenge of the Bogeyman. He's a spirit of evil captured forever in the glass of a mirror. Under the Hollywood sky, a filmmaker's dream becomes a nightmare. Once released, no one can halt the relentless revenge of the Bogeyman. So, Bogeyman 2, released in 1983... Uh, not exactly directed by Uli Lamel. Yeah, I'm still confused about this. I think it's one of those things where it's the reason he's credited is because that uses so much footage mm-hmm. from the other film. But this is a man named Bruce Pern who who directed it. Ah, right. Uh, okay. Trying to see. So I'd forgotten about that. It's just credited as Bruce Starr. I thought at first this is just some kind of pseudonym for Uli Lamel. But no, I don't think I don't mm. think so. No, no, it doesn't seem to be. Yeah, he's got all these other credits. Yeah, he's worked with Uli Lamel on some other stuff before. Mm. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, he he brought this this piece. I won't say a masterpiece. It's a piece. Mm. Uh, imagine if Jess Franco was called in. <laughs> yes. To direct the sequel. So here's the VHS tape. Uh, Boogeyman 2 from Syme Home Video. <laughs> it says, You didn't listen to Mama the first time. Now he's back again. <laughs> sure. Uh, the title of the, the plot says, A nightmare brought to life. A little girl is witness to a murder that haunts her for the rest of her life. A man becomes possessed and her nightmare becomes a reality. A bloody trail of bodies is left and the hunt for the boogeyman begins. So, I want to know, what else did did Syme video put out? (laughs) Syme? I... Like I said earlier in this episode, I had never watched this. Mm, Me neither. I saw saw the, the bullshit reliance on... Uh, footage from the first movie and bailed, which I had no idea just how bad that could get mm-hmm. with the the other sequel. Mm. Surprisingly, this didn't have as much footage from the first. It's kind of no. front loaded. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Although, did you see about um, that? Uh, oh, we mentioned it briefly before, didn't we? The kind of redux that Uli Lomel did, I think, in two thousand and three of this. Oh man, I. Did not find that. I did not know that existed I, until you kind of mentioned it this yeah, week, today. Yeah, I heard some information about it. Now, apparently, because like I say, I haven't seen it, uh, that it has 95% of footage from the original film. The footage from Boogeyman 2 is sped up, and the rest of it is in interviews with the, is it Mickey, the director character that Uli Lomel plays in this, being interviewed by the police because he's been taken in for the murders, apparently. What? Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> That's fucking amazing. Yeah, man. Uh, Syme Home Video was the Australian label. So that they put out Tourist Trap and 10 to Midnight and some other stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the American one that put out Boogeyman 2 is VC2 uh, or VCII. They put out Prowler, Uli Lamel's other films. Uh, oh, Night of the Demon. 
Yeah, boy. The 1980 one? Yep. Oh, man, Holy you know, shit. when I, for ages yesterday, it was one of those nights where forever I couldn't decide what to watch before I settled on the City of the Living Dead. And Night of the Demon, which I've only seen once, that nearly got picked. Who knows? Maybe oh, tonight. Yeah. Maybe tonight. I have all. I have also only seen that once. That's a hell of a film. It's, oh, it's something yeah. else. It's yeah. crazy. But uh, the plot of this one is uh, Suzanne Love's character, Lacey. She's gone off to Hollywood to visit her friend who named Bonnie, played by uh, Su- Suzanne. Excuse me, Shanna Hall, not Suzanne. Shanna Hall. <laughs> she and her husband uh, Mickey, mm. aka Uli Lamel. Uh, are, are in Hollywood and making a movie, shooting a movie in their their pool because that's how Hollywood works. And she's just there to recoup, to get away from the murders that plagued her. Her son is being watched by somebody, so we don't get any Kevin. No, mm. no Kevin reprising. Oh no. Uh, but they're they're in Hollywood, and as soon as Lacey tells them what's been going on with her and tells them about the murders and the mirror and all this shit, they're like, dude, get some Hollywood people out here. We got to do this. This would make a great movie. Uh, Mickey, uh, Uli Lamel is very frustrated by having to make a horror movie. Mm -hmm. And yet Mm -hmm. he's going to make a horror movie. And I love how similarly his, um, I've forgotten, just forgotten her name. Uh, but yeah, the, a friend, she within, you know, like about 30 seconds goes from, oh, I, f- I feel so sorry or bad or whatever she says, you know, about um, what's happened to her. Although, wouldn't this make a good movie? <laughs> oh, my God. I, I really like Uli Lamel. He, he can't act. Hmm. But, uh, I mean, he's, he's doing something. Hmm. But uh, there's just something about him. He's, he's kind of cool. He's got the like the leather jacket on. Seems like kind of a punk rock badass a little bit. I mean, he says, and I, I can kind of sympathize with this because I can go, you know, from like uh, <laughs> kind of, you know, mood swings and the rest of it. He seems in the, the interview I watched kind of very chill and potentially kind of, you know, sort of humble guy. But he, he admits, you know, and this is, I think, why the Paramount thing fell through that he can, you know, if somebody crosses him, it's like, yeah, I want to beat the fucking piss out of him. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So a bunch of Hollywood assholes come over and then the, oh, I don't want to forget the fricking butler. Mm. Mm-hmm. The butler is weird. Everyone's weird. Everything in this movie is so abstract and obtuse. All of it is just so strange. And the first person I thought of is our dear, sweet Jeffrey, our co-host. I was like, this is a fucking Jeffrey movie. And of course he loves it. Mm, I messaged him and he loves it. Uh, but it feels like a freaking Jess Franco movie. You just, folks, if just watch it. Like, just with the lens of it's, this is so bad. I mean, they had nothing. They had actors and they had zero special effects and it's definitely tongue in cheek. It's making fun of Hollywood. It's making fun of freaking sequelitis. And it's just perfect in its own terrible way. They had, other than blowing up a car, which of course it's <laughs> quick cut, the car disappears and there's a big explosion, you know, like, yeah. and, and, and the, the, the butler getting possessed by the mirror. Lacey's very protective of this mirror piece. Why she keeps it with her. <sighs> I guess she's trying to protect other people because she can't destroy it. Yeah, yeah. She's got it surrounded, I suppose, by all those like magical talismans or what have you. So maybe she thinks that, you know, if we keep all that stuff together, it will, uh, I don't know, cancel itself out or something. I don't know. I can't. Yeah, I can't even do this. It's so <laughs> funny. Then the, the butler is just so intrigued. He has to mm. go touch it. So he's running around using his psychic powers. He's possessed by our, our friend with the pantyhose. That was the moment where I was like, yeah, I'm, I, I fucking love this. And it was also around the time when the tape, you know, the Betamax that somebody put on YouTube yes. started to break down. And before we got to, and this is when I knew you would love it as well. Uh, and I, I love this sort of thing as well. Uh, how much stuff is set around that pool at night? Which again, that was where I yeah. heard the, the four out of five doctors music, which was like, w- w- oh yeah, this is from House of Sorority Row, which is doubly weird because how much of that takes place around the fucking pool <laughs> at night? It's like, what? Folks, I don't know what it is about me and swimming pools and horror movies i just love swimming pools it's just mm. something super soothing about it. i love it especially uh, the, the the way the light plays off oh the, 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 da- the dappled lighting the and all of that yeah yeah, yeah this, totally. this movie's oh man there's something about it it ain't good but it's something yeah. <laughs> when you're talking about the tracking the the, the tape being just trashed the, the, the there's parts of this that look so bad 
Mm. Like anytime they cut to the flashbacks, it is on. You can't see what in the world even they're trying to flashback to. Good thing we already saw it. Hey. God, yeah, boy howdy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this this is for my expectations were not even in the garbage. They mm-hmm. weren't that high budget. You know, they weren't. They were. No. They were in the uh, the slurry pit, if you will, for you British listeners out there. Oh, <laughs> and uh, I, I just I just could not believe how entertained by this I was. Mm. How it is such my vibe now. I hear that. Thanks to Jeffrey. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just it just seems like. And I said this. I don't know if I said this to you. Mm. This feels like a little film we covered on the show called The Urge to Kill. Oh, it rings it a bell. Feels I don't think I've seen it. Just like The Urge to Kill without the computer. It right. is just the same movie. Sleazy Hollywood types getting killed. In the in Urge to Kill, it's sleazy mu- uh, music people getting mm-hmm. killed. But yeah, this is this is fantastic. Mm-hmm. I don't recommend it. Well if you don't have that taste. If you don't have that if you don't like quiet, weird, I'm gonna just here. Yeah, here's some dialogue from the movie. This is a typical scene from Boogeyman Two. You, this is what we're dealing with right here. May I serve dessert? <clears throat> Would anyone care for dessert? Lacy. I have prepared loquats and kiwi fruit with a dash of quant Sure. <coughs> uh, no, no, not... Uh, not for me, thanks. So yeah, if that isn't your style, <laughs> if you don't revel in stupid, boring shit, then <laughs> but it's so baffling that it's not boring to me. Well, yeah, I mean, like you're saying on this again, you know, from the the weird ass vibe, and you know, yeah. special the nighttime and the pool stuff really helps. And just again from that, um, and I, you know, um, just context there, I I don't know what dialogue you displayed. So, but I wouldn't be surprised if that bit where all the people, and I'm glad you screenshotted this on Twitter, oh, yeah. where they're all being introduced, and it's almost like a film I've only seen once, but me and you keep talking about, it and I need to revisit when all the people are being introduced in uh, Cecil B. Demented. You know, they have all the director tattoos and stuff, and they're yep. all just like super weird. It's it's almost it's almost like that, you know, of just like everyone is just like off the tits. And that's even before, I think, you, you know, where I think at first they're all just like really eerily underlit by the, the pool. But Dude. later they, they chuck the kind of kaleidoscope refraction sort of effects and on it. That's the Jess Franco bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. The way the weapons are, are wielded, mm. a fucking electric toothbrush, can of... Uh, what do you call it? A can of like shaving, uh, shaving cream, yeah. Yeah. edge trimmer, uh, a garden hose. The exhaust was the one that got me. It was kind of like the shish kebab again, but even more ridiculously like phallic. And and very, yeah, very phallic, very perverse. Yeah, just, folks, track this one down. It's yeah. it's so dumb. It's so fantastic. Mm, totally. Let's, let's talk about something that less fantastic. Let's talk mm-hmm. about Return of the Boogeyman. 1994, if you thought Boogeyman 2 relied too much on footage from the previous film, you are wrong. This movie is almost the entire first film with some bumper scenes that are so unbelievably abstract in an even worse way. Even when they do have live sound, it is terrible. Mm. You cannot hear what people sang. In this movie, a character named Annie played by Kelly Galindo, is tormented by the memories of the first film, and she's being chased around in her dreams by the man with the pantyhose over his head. <laughs> uh, this was directed by someone named Deli- Deland News. Yeah. I think I'm pronouncing that right. So this is a thing that straight away I kind of knew was in for it. It's like e- when even the names in the credits are weird, it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> like we have one I, wrote, one I wrote down here was we have a Richard Quick which that made me laugh just because, well, you know, dick quick. Oh, I hear a dick quick barking. Oh, oh shit, yeah. 
<laughs> How could we not? I, I uh, almost, I'm just like used to. I almost blocked it out for a minute. And in the end <laughs> credits, we have a the costumes are by somebody called Alida Valley, but spell uh, like Valley Girl. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah. So not that one. Deland News. The only other horror film I think that he did was something called The Chilling. When she co-directed, it's uh, Linda Blair. Oh, God, Dan Haggerty's in it. Oh, boy. Troy Donahue. Okay, fuck. I need to see The Chilling. I want to chill. I'm going to chillax mm. and watch The Chilling. That sounds great. Yeah, man. There's a guy in this movie who I kept thinking, the actor, I kept think I wanted it to be freaking Uli Lamel all grown up, but it is not. <laughs> the, he's being... <laughs> She's being treated for her her crazy dreams by Dr. Ricky Love, (laughs) played by Omar Kazmierik. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Probably not. He is treating her, and I just he just reminds me of Uli Lamel, tired, bored. What am I doing here? But nope, it wasn't him. Unfortunately, they kept crediting uh, Susanna Love and Mm. uh, and Nicholas Love in the credits, so I kept Mm -hmm. waiting. I kept waiting for Susanna to show up in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you didn't do that too. Uh, I really can't remember now, but I hope they got some fucking realty checks at any rate. You know. Here's a hint. Speaking of Twin Peaks, mm-hmm. who does Kelly Galindo in this movie remind you of? Because I kept getting a fucking Twin Peaks vibe from this bullshit when she, especially when she was running on the beach. Oh, um, hmm. sorry, it just like, this is a few days since I watched this, and I think, you know, um, watching Boogeyman 2 since and so many other things have just broken my oh, brain. Oh, she just reminded me of Sherilyn Fenn. Yes, yes, looking at her on here, yeah. Uh, yeah dude, yeah. I just kept getting a Sherilyn Fenn vibe. Totally, yeah. She could have played like a doppelganger, one of, one of mm. uh, David Lynch's notorious doppelganger characters at some point in Twin Peaks. <laughs> uh, but I like Kelly Galindo. I feel she's... Yeah. Uh, she was no, she's still acting to this day. Lots of TV stuff, but man, she did not get a fair did not get a fair shake with this one. I, full disclosure here, folks. Mm. I'm gonna go ahead and confess. I started skipping around. I started fast forwarding. Oh, that's fair enough. Party sequence is is the best part of the movie. Out rage right. there's a cowboy <laughs> there's people everyone's muffled everyone's just blah, 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 blah. but it is such a garbage cash in oh my god this young lady annie is very psychic psychic oh really are you here to tell me the future in a certain sense yes we are in that case Go ahead. I'm always interested to hear. So this murder is supposed to take place in my house? Yes. 1754 will it drive, right, Annie? Yes, 1754. In my bathroom? That's right. At midnight. How exciting. Would you mind if we took a look at your bathroom, Mr. Bushel? Not at all. Okay, you guys. That's it. Mm-hmm. But dude, yeah, the, this movie uh, I hate to I hate <clears throat> to harsh on something, but this has earned its one point four on imdb i am not a i i i i I know i sound like i'm obsessed with uh fucking imdb ratings i'm not at all no but this is one of the worst things i've tried to sit (laughs) oh i understand i mean i think because you know at least with boogeyman 2 it's like like you say it's mostly front loaded with the reused stuff and there's not you know i think the the original stuff in the movie outweighs it because it's that special you know it just it I just think it's fucking magic, you know, even though I said to you before, going from one of some of our friends on the Facebook said, God bless him. I felt like, as I said to you, am I brain damaged in loving this movie? Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> shout, shout out to a couple of our buds and the, the multiverse yeah. group for just mm-hmm. telling us we're insane. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah i think they'll be glad to see we did we have indeed covered the original as well but um yeah with um 
<laughs> this third one, yeah, there's so much of it. It was like one of my, I've got very few notes, so I may as well read them. There's so much of it, I thought, part of me thought this is like the weirdest audio commentary ever. <laughs> you know, and the, uh, yes. in, in other ways, so like you say, the really bad sound and just the, the just the mind boggling, just what the fuck is going on ness of it. It made me think this is kind of like the boarding house of like horror sequels or something. I couldn't, you know, and that. Uh, <laughs> wow. You know, people take that for what it's worth. But no, I um, I, I hear you, and I being a complete masochist didn't actually skip any of it just because I was that Ooh. into the kind of weird vibe of the, the well the done kind of narration and the music over everything. And thankfully, you know, it's also you know that said, it is quite you know it's uh, like well, seventy five minutes quite short. But there were a few things which. Um, did kind of blow my mind. Not least of all, there was a line near the end about stockings, which was just fucking incredible. It was, I can't remember whether, uh, I don't know whether you caught this or not. Probably not. Yeah, basically it's like, and kind of spoiler alert, I guess, but, um, you know, because of the guy who she keeps seeing with the stocking over his head, uh, the kind of arc she goes on at the end was, and now it's all over, at least I can put my stockings on without, Oh you know, yeah. like, freaking out I or saw- whatever. I saw it. <laughs> that is a spoiler, man. No one's gonna watch it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoops, my bad. I finally won the battle over evil. The man with no face is gone. And Natalie is alive. I'm finally free. Dr. Love and Natalie set me free. Now I must try on my stockings to prove to myself one last time. That I am free. But here's the thing, folks. The Boogeyman series did not end there. Oh shit, I nearly forgot. There is a film that was completed, not released yet, called Boogeyman Colon Reincarnation. <laughs> Uli Lamel passed away in 2016? I want to yeah, say. Uh, yeah, around then. Uh, 2017. 20, yeah. So, so late 2017 so he almost made it to 2018 but he made a film called boogeyman colon reincarnation <laughs> uh with someone named skylar uh Radzion and himself he plays someone named mcduff so <laughs> Lamel back on the big screen um i don't recognize any of this cast i've not seen this uh but man i think we there's a trailer for it yeah and it doesn't look half bad it definitely mm. looks like a uh <laughs> A, a direct to streaming or direct to video 21st century movie mm. <laughs> whatever that means uh who knows i'd watch it i, yeah, just, me I too, just man. don't even know it's Again, so it looks weird. weird as fuck you know released posthumously well folks hopefully released posthumously yeah yeah uh, but skylar she's a very interesting look uh she's just got a strange look about her but uh yeah she's one of those up and coming actresses. She's been in stuff since 2015, making all kinds of things. Lots of short films. So we'll see. Maybe she'll mm-hmm. uh, be the next Scream Queen. Uh, I would watch this before I'd watch that new Don't Go in the Basement movie. Mm-hmm. That didn't look too hot. Mm. But fuck it. I'd watch both. <laughs> you know? Why not? Oh, so, Simon, we had, we went on a journey. <clears throat> oh, boy. No. Uh, big shout out to our buddy Mark. Yes, for again, thank you, Mark. You're he's very, very generous. To the show. Yeah, dude, you you gave and then you gave more, and we were like, "What?" So happy to mm. finally get to one of your requests. <laughs> well, yeah, like I said to you, I was you know itching to cover this anyway, you know, and even yep. more so after that. Yep, yep. I believe this is already on our list. Mm. Mm. The the sequels weren't, but and there we here we are. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad I finally watched them. I um, remember years ago in one of those video nasty sets seeing a trailer and a brief discussion of Revenge of the Bookie Man. I thought it looked. I know what you're saying about expectations. I, I was expecting something, you know, the the reused footage aside, re- expecting something interesting, and I think I certainly got that. But I was not expecting to get something that I cannot fucking wait to watch already and i was that night i was scanning like amazon and ebay and stuff trying to find a dvd you know like a dvd or a better copy of it yeah it's out there Mm. (laughs) (laughs) well folks thanks Mm. for listening and oh hi mark oh hi mark oh hi mark bye good night and we're done
Hello, This is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is the Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com or go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's still not enough, go to at doomedmoviethon on Twitter. You can write in to Hello, This is the Doom Show, use the email doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. Doom Show episodes are available on record and 8-track cassette. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.